My name is Genevieve Crane. I'm a staff hematopathologist here at Cleveland Clinic. And today, as part of the Insight series, I'm gonna go over a few of the lesions that we commonly see on our lymphoma service, which are CD30 positive uh, T-cell lymphoproliferative disorders. And these are particularly interesting because you often see a kind of a very aggressive morphologic appearance of these lesions, but they have potentially very different uh, clinical levels of aggression. And so it's very critical to correlate with the clinical presentation, as well as increasingly uh, molecular and cytogenetic data. So our first case is a young man who had a history of some kind of insect, uh, tick bites, and noticed some inguinal lymphadenopathy. He received antibiotic therapy and really with no improvement um, and subsequently underwent an excisional lymph node biopsy. And that's what we have here. Um, you can see these are a kind of just a very low power that overall we're seeing an enlarged lymph node and the architecture already doesn't look quite right. Um, we're not seeing any of the little follicles, the normal kind of lymph node uh, reactive follicles that we like to see. It's all just completely effaced and looking a little bit too pink. Just wait for the image to render there. And as you can see, as we get closer, we have some kind of clusters of atypical cells with kind of round to irregular nuclei and increased cytoplasm that are just filling up the lymph node and a face in the architecture. We have some interspersed stromal elements um, and some vascular structures. Uh, that are still there, but really nothing left of the normal lymph node. And if we want to look at these a little bit more closely, I'll zoom in so we can see the morphology a little bit better. As you can see here, um, let me see if I can find a good one for you. I mean, some of them have a little bit more cytoplasm, a little bit eccentric nuclei, prominent nucleoli, some of them a little bit more irregular, maybe a vague horseshoe shape to some of the nuclei, uh, are seen here. And we can see that this process basically extends all the way in to uh, the capsule and potentially extending into soft tissue, although we don't have any of that here. And certainly the sinuses are no longer patent. They seem to also be filled with these atypical cells. And there's a lot of kind of apoptotic debris from some of the cells that have died. Uh, some of that's been consumed by these macrophages single apoptotic cells, and frequent uh, mitotic figures. For example, there's one uh, shown here. So we received some additional data on this case, which is flow cytometry. Often that can be very helpful, kind of a single cell analysis, looking at expression level of different proteins on these cells. In this case, it kind of perplexed uh, the contributor. You, you had CD56 on the cells and CD13, but no other hematolymphoid antigens. They were negative for CD45. CD56 can be seen in a range of neoplasms, including plasmosome neoplasms, uh, monocytic histiocytic lesions, even carcinomas. CD13, we think of more of a histiocytic marker. So as a result, we went ahead and did some additional stains on this lesion. And so one of the stains that we did was MUM1. And this is a really nice stain uh, for these type of lesions. It's not very specific within the hematolymphoid field. It's kind of expressed on things that are post-germinal center. Plasma cells can be on B and T cell neoplasms, but it's typically not on uh, non-hematopoietic lesions. So MUM1 is positive in these large atypical nuclei, uh, kind of narrows it down to something that uh, does indeed belong on our hematopathology service. And this is a CD30. And you guess that's gonna be positive from the title of my uh, series today, but this is a very strong positive CD30. It's both membranous um, and Golgi staining, as we like to say. You can see these little dot-like uh, things here, which are uh, the Golgi that, that we see. This gives us a big clue to what uh, the diagnosis is going to be in this patient. And we do see CD56, as was seen by flow cytometry. KI67, which is a proliferation marker, also stains the vast majority of cells. Overall, the state is helping us, but we haven't really distinguished between could this be a plasma cell neoplasm, which could express MUM1, CD56, uh, CD30, and have a high KI, or could it be some sort of even a, you know, a T cell neoplasm, like anaplastic large cell lymphoma, of course, can have the strong uh, CD30 um, and would also be expected to be MUM1 positive. CD56 can be seen in some cases. Uh, so to narrow this down, we uh, do have a CD138, which is typically expressed on plasmablastic lymphomas. It's completely negative. 
uh, looking at T cell markers, which we knew were negative on the surface of the cells, CD3 is also negative internally in, in, in these cells. There are some scattered CD3 positive T cells. Looking at B cell markers, which in the setting of a CD30 positive lesion is also important. For example, could you be dealing with a Hodgkin lymphoma? In this case, the cells are just far too dense to really consider that, although you can see um, syncytial lesions in some cases. Uh, but the PAX5 is completely negative. So this thing is not appearing to be of a B cell lineage. CD20 uh, is also negative. So going back to see if we have any other uh, T cell markers, can we definitively assign this thing to a lineage? Uh, CD2 is negative. CD5 is negative, CD7 is negative. What about CD4 and CD8? CD8 is negative and CD4 is actually looking pretty good. We're seeing at least partial expression, including that nice uh, membranous and Golgi pattern. Although CD4 is not very specific, CD4 is also on histiocytes and can be non-specifically expressed in a variety of, of settings. But this is good uh, for our favorite diagnosis with uh, CD30 and CD4. What you also typically see in anaplastic large cell lymphoma, which can be quite helpful because um, it typically does often lack CD3 as well as other T cell markers, are uh, cytotoxic markers. And that's why um, routinely, even if we're looking at a Hodgkin case, we will do uh, cytotoxic markers just to exclude that this thing might be an anaplastic large cell lymphoma that looks a little bit atypical. And here we see some TIA1, a little bit more granzyme B expression and quite extensive perforin uh, cytotoxic marker expression within these cells. And finally, uh, this is a young patient. Typically, ALK positive ALCL is seen in younger patients. It's localized disease. Um, this is a good setting, especially with that morphology, to be an ALK positive ALCL. And in fact, um, it was. And you can see the staining here is cytoplasmic as, as well as nuclear. And so uh, this is a nice case, a very uh, classic example, in fact, of anaplastic large cell lymphoma, ALK positive. And typically these uh, cells, they're large pleomorphic um, anaplastic, as, as the name would suggest, but typically you will see at least a subset of cells with these horseshoe shaped, and there's one here um, in the top image of a horseshoe shaped nuclei or so-called hallmark cell, uh, called for that reason because they are present in all the morphologic variants. As I said, this is the most common variant where you have kind of these sheets of the large atypical cells, but there is also a small cell variant. You may have a, you know, ALCL that's more rich in histiocytes as well, making it a little bit more difficult to recognize. You should also have strong CD30 staining, that strong membranous uh, and Golgi pattern on the large atypical cells, which we did see here. And finally, ALK um, is a really powerful tool that we have uh, for these lesions. It's um, an immunohistochemical marker, but it actually directly correlates with the presence of an ALK translocation. And how the staining pattern looks directly correlates with the type of translocation that is there as well. Uh, the most common translocation is that of ALK with an NPM1, and the, the T25 translocation, that's seen in 85% of these ALK positive cases, and you'll see this nuclear cytoplasmic staining. But in other uh, translocations, you'll see um, more often uh, just the cytoplasmic staining. So unlike other cases where in hematopathology we've tried to correlate IHC staining with potential cytogenetic results, such as in our double hit large B cell lymphomas, where MYC and BCL2 um, expression do not necessarily correlate with the presence of a MYC and BCL2 and or BCL2 translocation, it's very uh, consistent in, in these cases of ALK positive ALCL and kind of obviates the need to do a cytogenetic or FISH testing on these lesions. In addition, ALK is extremely powerful because it's not expressed in the vast majority of adult tissues, so it's very specific. And these patients have a good overall survival around 80% long term. So my next case, um, in contrast to the first, is an elderly gentleman. He had some soft tissue swelling in his parotid and subsequently underwent an excision. And what we see here, I apologize, I don't, I don't have the whole slide image for you, but what we see here is some areas of residual parotid and then this large atypical looking uh, lymph node in there where the architecture has been largely effaced. And you can see at the edge of the node that there is a rim of uh, very dark cells, the very dark lymphoid cells, which are actually our residual lymph node cells, and there's some residual follicles in there. But the vast majority of this node has been taken over by these large atypical cells. They have fairly round nuclei with prominent nucleoli, not so much of um, 
the horseshoe shaped nuclei, at least in this picture that I was describing, but these large atypical cells. And classically, they may show kind of a cohesive pattern, and certainly from low power, it looks a little bit cohesive. Over a higher power, we don't really see cell cell junctions, and these look more like atypical lymphoid cells. Now, interestingly, within that same resection, there was another node uh, which looked, at least grossly from low power, um, potentially not involved. But examining more closely, we could see in the lymph node sinus that there was actually this atypical proliferation of cells, somewhat of more of a mixed uh, group of cells, including these large atypical cells that had kind of more horseshoe nuclei. And that's actually a very common feature of anaplastic large cell lymphoma to actually crawl into the sinuses of the lymph nodes, uh, similar to like a metastatic carcinoma would do. And looking at it more closely, we can see it, indeed, even though in that main face lymph node, that we did not see as much of a horseshoe shape or hallmark nuclei that we are seeing that here. And indeed, this uh, particular neoplasm showed a similar phenotype as we saw in the first case with cytotoxic markers, strong membranous and Golgi CD30, uh, MUM1, uh, but it was negative for ALK, as would typically be seen in a more elderly uh, patient. What do we do now? We can just report that. We know that ALK negative ALCL is now a definitive category with on our WHO monograph. However, there may be a little bit more that we can do that is helpful in terms of patient management and in, in terms of understanding the prognosis for this patient. As I mentioned, the ALK positive ALCL has a very positive outcome. ALK negative, all comers, is around 40 to 50% five year survival, so quite a big difference. However, it's a much more heterogeneous group. And within that, some excellent work which has done, been done by others, including uh, Dr. Feldman's group at the Mayo Clinic, has found that around 30% of these patients will have a DUSP22 rearrangement at or near the DUSP22 IRF4 locus on 6P25.3. And the significance of that is that these patients tend to have a much better survival, in fact, maybe even better than ALK positive ALCL with a five-year survival around 80 to 90%. Unfortunately, another subset, 8%, will have a TP63 translocation. And this has been associated with a much worse prognosis and in fact only around a 17% five-year survival. So knowing this information up front may help uh, with treatment planning and certainly with um, understanding prognosis. In addition, other things such as or before barren expression may be directly targetable. And so it can be valuable uh, to not just stop at ALK negative ALCL, but to extend that a little bit further. In addition, uh, loss of lymph one or TP53 is also associated with a worse prognosis. Now importantly, whereas in the first case, probably just staining with CD30 and um, ALK would have been sufficient to potentially arrive at, at the diagnosis. But in the case of ALK negative ALCL, that needs to be more carefully differentiated from other forms of, of peripheral T cell lymphoma. Uh, these translocations that are present you know, with prognostic significance in ALK negative ALCL can also be present in other forms of peripheral T cell lymphoma, potentially uh, with or without uh, the same implications. So it's important to first establish a diagnosis of ALK negative ALCL, and then these additional prognostic tools can potentially be utilized. So for our third case, uh, this is a young adult woman who had a history of multiple dental procedures and began developing some gum hyperplasia, uh, which, additionally, which initially was uh, thought to be a result of potentially a reaction uh, to the dental procedures, but then she subsequently developed a hard palate lesion, which is a little bit more concerning. And, and so that is a specimen here where they have resected a portion of this hard palate lesion. Um, and as you can see here, it's a little bit pink. Uh, I'll wait for it to render. And just getting a little bit closer, there's not a whole lot of architecture here. We have kind of a mixed population of atypical cells, some of which are quite large. Uh, they appear mitotically active. Some of them have kind of a regular, maybe sort of indented or horseshoe shaped nuclei and kind of a moderate amount of pale, um, it looks almost kind of clear cytoplasm here, but I think it's kind of retraction artifact uh, that we have. 
So this lesion, uh, particularly in a young adult patient with gum hyperplasia, you start to think, could this be acute myeloid leukemia, sort of a monocytic leukemia, which tends to invade the gums um, and certainly could result in a hard palate lesion and these sort of curved nuclei that you see um, you know, those could be some sort of monocytic or myeloid cell that's partially differentiating, and you could have kind of a range that you might typically see in a myeloid sarcoma, ranging from, you know, very immature uh, to more slightly maturing uh, myeloid series. Uh, but this was a little bit funny um, in terms of that. Um, and of course, uh, you have to be sure what you're dealing with, and so, so we did a number of stains. And so I'm going to show you uh, those stains on PowerPoint. So this is our, our same case here, our a woman with a, it ends up being a 30-30 positive mucosal lymphoproliferative disorder, and you can see it was a slightly different recut of an H&E I've obtained here, and maybe the morphology of the nuclei is a little bit more clear, but again, you see kind of a range of cell types, some very large, immature looking, and mitotically active. We did some stains, so at least some partial dim staining uh, for T-cell markers, although it's really not definitive. And you can see partial dim staining in a variety of settings, including on myeloid neoplasms uh, for uh, T-cell antigens, that there's some lineage, potential lineage infidelity, and it's certainly not strong or overly convincing. In addition, other T-cell markers were also absent. CD56 uh, appears again, as it did in the first case, and this can be particularly confusing in this setting because myeloid sarcomas are often CD56 positive, and they often express CD4. The CD33, which you would expect to be positive on some sort of myeloid lesion, it's fairly equivocal here. It certainly is on background histiocytes, but very questionable and dim whether or not it might be on our cells of interest. And they do express CD43, which can be expressed in a range of hematolymphoid uh, neoplasms. They are negative for granzyme B in contrast to our first case, but we do see fairly significant staining for the cytotoxic marker perforin as well as even better, uh, slightly more convincing staining for TIA1. So the combination of CD56 and a cytotoxic marker may have began to feel that this is really a T-cell neoplasm. It was negative for other myeloid markers, such as CD34 and CD117, as well as lysozyme and myeloperoxidase. In addition, it is positive for CD30. The stain is not quite as striking as we saw in the first case. Um, it is membranous, Golgi may be a little bit weaker and a little bit variable, although it is on the majority of the cells. And the KI-67, as in many of our other neoplasms, has been uh, very, very high in this case. Most of the cells are actively proliferating. We ended up diagnosing this as a mucosal CD30 positive T cell lymphoproliferation based on its partial expression of some T cell antigens, the cytotoxic markers, and the presence of a T cell clone to help seal the diagnosis, having excluded other potential entities. But how should we really classify this? This is an isolated hard palate lesion, or at least appeared to be, um, with some gum hyperplasia that was not biopsied itself. Um, so is this uh, anaplastic large cell lymphoma? Or is this potentially just like an isolated uh, mucosal lymphoproliferative process? And we can potentially think of the mucosa because it is uh, a squamous epithelium, sort of like the skin. So could this be sort of uh, like a cutaneous ALCL that has a less aggressive course compared to systemic, or even uh, something more on the order of a lymphomatoid papulosis that may be uh, something that may wax and wane and, and not require aggressive therapy? And in fact, the group of the Mayo has also more closely looked at this with a series of 15 patients, seven of whom had only mucosal disease of these kind of CD30 positive uh, lymphoproliferative lesions and found that all of those patients with isolated mucosal lesions did quite well, even uh, some of them who did not receive systemic chemotherapy. And they did find that a subset of these patients had that very favorable translocation of the DUSP22 IRF4. But this particular lesion was a little bit curious as it did express strong P63. And the P63 is positive in cases that, by IHC, that end up having the TP63 translocation in ALCL, which I told you had uh, inferior prognosis. Um, and this particular case also did have the TP63 translocation when that was tested. But it's unclear um, in this setting with isolated mucosal disease whether or not uh, that uh, has the same sort of significance. And that is an area which remains to be examined.
This is our, our final case, case four. This is a woman with a history of a breast implant who developed a seroma and subsequently underwent um, excision of the capsule. Um, and we have the capsule here. Um, and what you can see is that overall, the capsule does not look overwhelmingly thickened. We have some residual fiber adipose tissue from the patient. And as well on one edge, we do have uh, the seroma cavity here. And sometimes in these uh, entities, um, breast uh, implant associated ALCL, which has been uh, receiving a lot of press lately, you may see a mass forming lesion. But you can see in this case that we really don't see a particular mass and someone actually even uh, put little dots uh, so that we could find the area of interest. So there may be a focal involvement and of these particular lesions, although it does extend beyond this area where we see the dots. And in fact, if we kind of zoom in here, I'll wait for it to render, we see kind of two layers of this atypical inflammatory infiltrate. At the bottom, there's kind of a more mixed inflammatory infiltrate where we see uh, quite a few actually eosinophils, which can be a clue to a variety of types of pathology, including T cell lymphomas. T cell lymphomas are often associated with eosinophils. Um, other things uh, such as classic Hodgkin lymphoma are as well, as well as some benign uh, conditions. But as we can see, intermixing between these brightly positive eosinophils, that we do have some large atypical cells with irregular nuclei and somewhat increased cytoplasm. These atypical cells are a little bit more prominent in this upper layer here. And in, and in fact, you can see some that are quite atypical with, these, with open chromatin and very bright kind of cherry red nucleoli, almost sort of look like Reed-Sternberg cells. Other forms have a little bit more angulated uh, nuclei. Potentially, you could say that you, you see some of the, of the horseshoe-shaped uh, nuclei as well here. And so this was also staining brightly positive for CD30, as well as cytotoxic markers, and will show a similar phenotype to other forms of anaplastic large cell lymphoma. But these are um, very unusual neoplasms. Even of women who develop these with breast implants, it's around one out of every 500,000 to one out of every 3 million uh, patients with a breast implant that will develop such lesions. And our experience with them is still growing Growing. However, um, they appear to largely just either involve the seroma, the fibrous capsule, or uh, potentially local regional lymph nodes, but patients typically do very well um, with excision alone with very rare cases of disseminated disease. I just wanted to thank everyone for attending today and reviewing some of the range of CD30 positive T cell lymphoproliferative diseases that can be seen on our lymphoma service. Um, I didn't even uh, scratch the surface really of cutaneous uh, CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorders, which are also a very interesting area for further discussion. Um, I also wanted to call your attention uh, for anyone interested in learning more about kind of how to approach these lesions or lymph node pathology in general, that my lymph node pathology uh, survival guide together with Dennis O'Malley uh, will be out soon um, and you may uh, find that of interest. Also, any questions you have, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter with my hashtag is at Eve Marie Crane. And, and again, thank you so much for listening today.